Welcome back to our reflection on the Gospel, of the Sunday Gospel. We're coming up to Palm Sunday, so the Gospel that we are reflecting on today uh, is the Passion story as it's presented by Matthew. We feel that to read the whole of the Passion story might not fit in with the process that we're doing here, so we're going to read a selection which is basically the scene in the garden and the arrest of Jesus and the actual crucifixion of Jesus. And I think with those texts we are able to include the other aspects of the Passion story. So we begin with the Gethsemane account. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane and he said to his disciples, Sir, stay here while I go over here and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay away with me. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words, then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him with a large crowd, with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man, arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it and struck the slave of the, right, of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would scripture be fulfilled? We say it must happen in this way. At that hour Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me? as though I were abandoned. Day after day I sat in the temple teaching and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. The crucifixion of Jesus. As they went out, they came upon a man named Simon from Cyrene. They compelled him to carry the cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he wants to. 
for he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. We've read an, an abbreviated um, version of the, of the Passion story, so I'd just like to approach it from several different points of view. The first of all, that Jesus is presented as king. This is not a, an expression we like to use much of Jesus today, even though the climax of the liturgical year is the, the kingship of Jesus. But it, it means much more in the context of the gospel. That Matthew made it clear from the very beginning by giving the genealogy of Joseph that Jesus was the Davidic king. So it's not so much the word king, but Jesus is the one who is the one who is to come. He is the descendant of David, who um, the people uh, were expecting. And Jesus is acknowledged as that in mockery. They were he mocked as the king of the Jews. And yet, in fact, as Matthew is sort of acknowledging that he is the king of the Jews. He's crowned with thorns and given a, a purple robe to bring out the fact that he was king. And the very um, statement on the cross, he is the king of the Jews. So clearly, this account is about who Jesus is. He is the king of the Jews, and that's why he is being um, put to death. A second thing that I want to just mention is that, that really uh, Matthew is, is pointing out that it had to happen uh, in this way. Uh, in, in, in the account of the arrest, uh, Jesus says, but all this has, to, has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. In other words, this is the way it had to happen. And when um, one of the disciples, Peter, according to another gospel, draws his sword, um, Jesus said, well, put that away. If I want help, I can call on God to send legion of angels. Uh, this is the way it's got to happen. How then would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen in this way? So really what's unfolding is clearly being presented as something that had to happen. I've always been amazed in, in the Gospel of um, Matthew that he doesn't say that they crucified Jesus as to Mark and Luke. What he says was, having crucified Jesus, they divided lots for his clothes. That the word crucified is just a participle. Which is more important, the crucifixion or the dividing his clothes? Well, for Matthew, it's the dividing his clothes because that's the way Psalm 22 verse 18 mm. said it would happen. In other words, what's being presented is something uh, that had to happen. Uh, Luke takes this up uh, in talking to the, um, the two on the road to Emmaus. Mm. And he says to them, he says, um, Oh, you foolish men, so slow to believe the message of the prophets. Was it not ordained that the Christ should suffer and so enter into his glory. So what's being presented here is really what is happening to Jesus. It was supposed to happen. Mm. Uh, and in fact, it's fulfilling what has happened. If we were to stop there, we, we sort of have Jesus a bit like Lazarus, uh, being the one to whom it is all done. Um, so far, we haven't asked the question, what was Jesus doing uh, while all of this was happening? Well, clearly Jesus acknowledged that this has happened in the garden. He says, come, let us go. He's ready for what is going to take place. And um, he is ready to submit to what, what's about to take place. So really we've got to ask, is it enough to say that important is what happened to Jesus? Or are we to ask, what did Jesus do in all of this? And that's the importance of the garden where Jesus says, if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me, but let not my will, but thine be done. In other words, it's setting the scene that what takes place on Calvary is something about the relationship between Jesus and the Father. Now, if he were there on Calvary, he wouldn't have seen that. He would have just seen what they did to Jesus. But what the Gospel is presenting, that behind that, what is happening in the heart of Jesus is that he is fulfilling, he is being faithful uh, to the will um, of the Father. 
And I think on the cross, as they mock him and say, if you are the son of God, come down, if you are the king. This, this is like what took place in the temptations in the desert. Right? And the temptation in the desert was to draw Jesus away from the mission that he had. Was he to be an economic messiah and give people bread, to be a miracle worker and jump off the temple and be raised up and to be the leader of all the kingdoms of the world? But no, that wasn't what he was called to do. And as he's on the cross, he is tempted to, uh, if you like, give in to something that he wanted to get out of, but rather he chooses to be faithful um, to the will of the Father. So the important event is not what they did to Jesus, which is the way people like the filmmakers presented the Passion, but what Jesus actually did. And in another part of the Gospel, we see Jesus saying, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And that's it precisely what Jesus is modelling here. He's denying himself, he's letting something happen that he didn't want to do, but he's embracing the cross because that is the will of the Father. I think you should write a book. <laughs> yeah. it, it's so familiar and yet so complex, complex yeah. every time you hear yeah. it. And I did for the first time ever, as I heard, heard the word proclaimed, uh, the echo of Into the Wilderness came through to me. Yeah. Um, whereas Into the Wilderness, the 40 days, you know it's 40 days and he comes out because it's the beginning of the story. Whereas the sense here, is that the same temptations without no, you know, at that time, the absolute desolation that this taunting and it looks like it came to nothing. Um, so I think this year it felt like Satan was, was speaking through the words of the people yeah. around him yeah. that there's this great evil that was being. Yeah. Um, but it was overcoming the light, mm. that just in these scenes here. Mm. And the desolation in Gethsemane, when he's, those disciples have been with him all the time and he asks one thing, they can't manage it. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. I know it's the fulfilment of the, but the actual experience of it is one of sheer desolation. Yeah. Mm. Can I just pick up yes. on the desolation of yes. Jesus? I didn't mention that, my God, my God, why have you deserted me? And I think scholars see that as Jesus um, really you know, suffering greatly. But it is also the first verse of Psalm 22, yes. which is a psalm of yes. lament and confidence yes. in God. Yes. Yes. So it captures the fact that even in the midst of all of this, Jesus yes. is in contact with the Father. Yes. And we didn't read about the end where Jesus uh, gives up his spirit. Yes. Now in the Gospel of John, that's the giving of the bankrupt paraclete. Yes. And in the Gospel of Luke, yes. these last words are, um, into your hands, hands I, I commend, commend my spirit. spirit. Yes. So um, the relationship with the Father is there. Yes. And, and you have, I suppose, been yeah. really well versed in the Jewish understanding right. yeah. because um, mm. I was reading Francis Maloney's commentary, yeah. like the beginning and the end of Matthew's Gospel yeah. are perfect echo because right. yeah. Emmanuel in the beginning mm, and I'll right. be with you always. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's Very there, true. it's there. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, it's, I think that the popular imagination yes. of the passion is not the... Yes, what what's he's coming saying. through yeah. in the scripture yeah. now. Yeah. They're accepting that it had to happen and it did happen yeah. and they accept that Jesus accepted it. But it, it, in a sense it's more than an acceptance, it's an embrace. It's a, it's a going into it deliberately because this which is, is the way Which to is go. the divinity. Because, yeah. yeah. you know, yeah. the humanity, would yeah. have, the humanity is the desolation, whereas the divinity is, I'm, I'm fulfilling it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I might be changing your words just slightly, <laughs> yeah. David, but but I, I, if, if I am, I'm doing it for a purpose. Yeah. And I think I heard you say it's not so much what um, was being done to Jesus, but what was Jesus doing. And I couldn't help but think, isn't that another way, and a, perhaps a more appropriate way of looking at the sacrament of reconciliation? Because it's not so much what we've done, but what are we going to do about it? And that means, why do I follow Jesus? 
And there's so much in, in, in when you look at this, and if you start back from from the um, you know the palms being carried in and all this jubilation, and then it's like overnight they've changed. And and so what makes me then you know continue to want to think about you know is there a commitment that's involved in that? Is there some kind of outcome uh, of that com commitment that brings me to do something? And to contribute that work of Jesus in the world, and and how the whole experience of dying and rising um, is something again that becomes hope filled and uh, and fulfilled in me and in all of us. Yeah, so that that was where I, I was beginning, I and where I, I kind of yeah, yeah. and I, I just thought that into I don't know why it came into my mind just now about the sacrament of reconciliation, yes. that part of it. And I think you know we, we you know for for a minister of the sacrament, or one who work you know that it's not so much assigning something to to the penitent having confessed, but I think they know what they've got to do. Yes. We don't have to kind of assign anything. Mm. But you look at the smorgasbord of my peccadillos there on the table, and I I I, I pick one of them, and I, and I work with that. I, I know what I've got to do. Mm. And, and I think we know, if we do believe in Jesus, what we've got to do. And we can easily just um, let it roll off the tongue, over, flip over the head and, um, you know, I've fulfilled this and I've done that and it's something else. But we really haven't engaged with what you mentioned earlier, and both of you, the, the heart. Mm. Thanks, John. We invite you now to, to draw something from the text. As you can see, there's so much in the text. But don't just go by what we have said. What is the Lord saying to you as you reflect on this text? Welcome back. We invite you now to listen to the reading again. It's a long reading, but it's just filled with um, uh, a message that comes to us from the Lord. Then Jesus went with them into a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me for one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away, and for the second time, and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass until I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him. Arrived with him was a large crowd, with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given him a sign, saying, "The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him." At once he came up to Jesus and said, "Greetings, Rabbi." And kissed him. And Jesus said to him, "Friend, do what you do what you are here to do." Then he came and lay hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on the sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, "Put your sword away, into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword." Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once 
send me more than twelve legions of angels. But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen in this way? At that hour Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me, as though I were a bandit? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. The, the personal thing for me that came out of it was just a lying, that saying of Jesus with the account that if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Excuse and I, I was focusing on the... Just before you go on, oh. I haven't read the crucifixion. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that okay? Okay. So we'll just cut that bit and I'll read it. Oh, that's, that's okay. Yeah, that's good. Cut Is that, that okay? That's great, I should. As they went out, they came upon a man. No, beg your pardon. It's the death of Jesus. No, sorry. Crucifixion okay. over the page. Yes, over the page. Is it 32? No, it's 27. It's. And, and that, that's the end. A crucifixion? Yeah. As they ca- a man's son. Uh, Yep, okay. Are you right with that? As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on the left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would be you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him. Let God deliver him now. He wants to. He said, I am God's Son. Then the bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. The the point that I drew out, just in terms of my own personal life, was linked to that saying, um, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And I was focusing on denial and the practice of self-denial which is, or should be, a normal part of our journey to God. Saint Teresa Ravala says, if you just go to God in terms of contemplation, you'll end up a spiritual dwarf. Really, there is the practice of the virtues, the self-denial, that is important. And I, I think we're in Lent, and I, I really think we haven't played, or I think we have played down, the self-denial of Lent. I don't think it's nearly as strong as it was, and. Other things are, are, are suggested we can do, and that they're quite good things. But I think self-denial is really the principal instrument that we have uh, in being able to embrace the cross, the cross that sometimes we don't wish to embrace. So I thought I'd look at my own life and see how the practice of self-denial is, is being practiced. And for me today, it was the phrase, stay awake. I'm not quite sure why, but um, not to sleep through my belief, but to stay awake. It's being alert. Alert. That's what it is, you know, to the things we're talking about. I was thinking of um, something that I was saying a little earlier, and why, why follow Jesus? And I, and I think then, you know, it entails so much pain and suffering and rejection and 
hurt and so on. So is all of this that follows as a consequence of following, I've got to wrestle with the fact, is this all worthwhile? We invite you now to draw something practical from the Gospel that you can implement in your life. It's not enough just to go to God by prayer alone, but by putting into practice the things that transform our life. So draw, draw out something practical. Having done that, we now seek the grace to actually put into practice what we have chosen. Let us turn to the Lord and ask, and we shall receive to seek and we shall find. To knock and it shall be opened, that we will receive the grace to do what we have chosen to do. Thank you for being with us. Um, this is really a special time for us. We don't really know what's taking place behind the camera, but we do know that a lot of people are reflecting seriously on the Word of God and allowing God to speak to them through the Scriptures. So we invite you now to share this with others through our website, lexiodivina.org.au. And we conclude now by reading from the Gospel uh, of the Liturgy of Palm Sunday. Almighty of a living God, who as an example of humility for the human race to follow, caused our Saviour to take flesh and submit to the cross, graciously grant that we may heed his lesson of patient suffering and so merit a share in his resurrection, he who lives and reigns forever and ever.